Welcome to lesson 68 of Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness. It's called Ordaining Priest to People vs. Yahweh. And so this is going to be, and I say this every time, is because I'm really excited every time we do these lessons because they're really fun to do. They honestly are. Um, I know they're going to be around for a really long time, but um, it is, really is an honor to do this with you. It's going to be a really great lesson. I love learning with you. I love being taught by Yahweh, and I love, as he teaches me, to teach you it's a blessing it really is it, very, it really is and so ordaining priests to people versus Yahweh it's a really good lesson let's get into it and so first Kings 13 right uh, we're, we've been around uh, with Jeroboam for a little bit now we're almost done with his story and his uh, involvement in this uh, story of God leading to Christ but says after this event Jeroboam did not return from his evil way but again he made priests of the high places from among all the people any who any who would he ordained to be priests of the high places. This event became sin to the house of Jeroboam, even to blot it out and destroy it from off the face of the earth. So, you know, there this is actually a common thing that we've seen so far with the story of Jeroboam is that he is um, ordaining priests that are not chosen by God, essentially. Right. He's choosing people who are just any ordinary people, anybody who wants to be a priest. He lets them be it. Now, this is actually a reality thing that many of us, um, you know, when we, how do I say this? I don't want to say live in the world because this has to do with, um, you know, the church of God and many things. But we, we live in, in this world where anybody who wants to be a priest, you know, they, they tell them to go to school and then they show up or sometimes they have to go to school. They, they go to the church, they serve under the pastor. And if they, you know, feel the requirements of, you know, a, a deacon class or a pastoral class or whatever it is. Okay, you can be a priest. Well, the reality in God's eyes of choosing priests in the kingdom of heaven is that there are requirements. There are requirements. And it's not just about your, your physical life. It's about the choosing. It's about the anointing. It's about many. There are many things that go into why someone is chosen to be a minister uh, by Yahweh. But. And there's and it's not physical things. And we'll talk about this in a second. We'll talk about, well, trust me, we're going to talk about a lot of things in a second. I'm sure many things are coming to your mind. You may be thinking about Paul's letters, about, you know, different roles in the church and different things of that manner. We're going to talk about this. It's all in this lesson. Just hang tight. But we have to understand that, you know, the Lord chose the Levites <clears throat> because of their willingness that they were jealous for God. That's what the story says in Numbers. They were jealous for God and they were willing to do anything to get sin out of the camp. And they were willing to, to punish the disobedient. They were willing. They didn't care if it was father, mother, brother, sister. They were going to get rid of the evil in the camp. And Yahweh loved that about them. That's why he chose them. He said, because you know what? You're not impartial and you're going to, you're going to act out my judgments. But Jeroboam, who we know is, we've already, we've been with him for a little bit. We know that he he instituted his own feasts, his own holidays. We know that um, he he put idols in in Bethel and in Dan to to be a stone block to the sons of Israel, so they would forget the Lord their God. You know now, we, and we see once again that he's putting priests in places that were not chosen to be priests. Anyone who just wanted to be it or did it, he let them do it. And it's funny because in the world. You know, we would call someone, oh, they're they're evil or they're this or they're that because they tell someone, no, you can't be a priest. But in God's eyes, he does say no to people. You cannot minister in this role. And so we have Jeroboam. He's putting people in place that are not meant to be there. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about priesthood. We're going to learn a lot right now about priesthood. A lot. Because even though he's doing this. We have to understand that how I say this, Yahweh allows things and he uses things for the good. And I'm going to show you how even someone like Jeroboam, who was putting these priests in places. Yahweh uses this in his plan for the good. He uses this in his plan for the good. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you understand, you realize how does he use priests that were not chosen for the good. How does he do that? 
And so we're going to Ezekiel 44, one of my absolute favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Um, if you were to talk to me personally, you probably, probably have heard me mention this chapter because it is such a deep chapter. It's such a great chapter of the reality of the kingdom of heaven. But it says, then he brought me by, by way of the north gate to the front of the house. And I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And I fell on my face. The Lord said to me, son of man, mark well, see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the statutes of the house of the Lord and concerning all its laws. And mark well the entrance of the house with all exits, exits of the sanctuary. You shall say to the rebellious ones, to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, enough of all your abominations, O house of Israel. OK, so. Notice that he's telling him to mark well and he's telling him to pay attention to his laws concerning the, the laws and the statutes concerning the house of the Lord. This is so important. It's so uh, pay attention. Please pay attention. If you don't have a notepad out, take your notepad out, pay attention and write down what he is saying because it's so important. Now, notice when the first thing he says, you shall say to the rebellious ones, to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, enough of all your abominations, O house of Israel. This is a message that he's telling him from his heart that should flow enough of your abominations. He's telling people he's not telling people to uh, stay comfortable in their abominations. He's not telling people to that they're OK just as they are in their abominations. He says, enough of your abominations. In a sense, we're getting the, the, the primary message of Christ after he was tempted in the wilderness in Matthew 4. He goes on to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. Enough of your abominations. You must repent. Now, let's keep going because we have a lot to talk about. When you brought in foreigners uncircumcised in heart um, and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to profane it, even my house, when you offered my food, the fat and the blood, for they made my covenant void. This, in addition to all your abominations, and you have not kept charge of my holy things yourselves, but you have set foreigners to keep charge of my sanctuary. So, I'm sorry, this actually goes along with the last verse about the abominations. He is saying specifically the abominations now, right? He's saying the abominations you've done, you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh. So once again, I want you to stay out of the carnal mindset as we're talking. We've talked enough by now that you can understand that everything he's talking about is spiritual. We're not talking about, um, how do I say this, a, 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 uh, a Hebrew in flesh and a Gentile in flesh. We're talking about a Hebrew in spirit and a Gentile in spirit. He's, like he says, uncircumcised in heart. And in flesh, which is uncircumcised in heart. So this is an abomination to him that you've brought people who are uncircumcised in heart to be in his sanctuary to profane it. The reality is anyone who is not circumcised in heart, um, they have no option but to profane it. Their, their heart is unclean. This, their heart is not even able to love the Lord in the manner that he has chosen for his people to love them. And we'll get into that in a second. Technically, but to be uncircumcised in heart is to still be in the flesh. He's calling these people unreborn, uncircumcised, still in the flesh, still fleshly. So he brought them into his house. He says, when you offer my food, the fat and the blood, for they made my covenant void. He said, they made my covenant void. This, in addition to all your abominations, and you have not kept charge of my holy things yourselves, but you have set foreigners to keep charge of my sanctuary. Foreigners. Foreigners. What is a foreigner? A foreigner is someone that's unfamiliar with his ways, that does not know his ways, that was, that's not trained and brought up in his ways. They are foreign. It's not familiar to them. They don't know it. It's not their nature. It's not their nature. The nature of someone in the flesh versus someone that's reborn is completely different. The nature of someone in their flesh is to live of the flesh. The nature of someone who was reborn, someone circumcised of heart, is um, to live in the spirit. That's their nature. 
But this is abominable in his sight to bring people who are still in the flesh to serve in his sanctuary, to serve in his house. They should not be serving. Now, let's keep going. because He's going to say a whole lot more. We're going to learn how he uses this for the good, though. Let's keep listening. Thus says the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh of all the foreigners who are among the sons of Israel shall enter my sanctuary. Now, notice he says among the, the foreigners, um, among the foreigners Brazil, of all the foreigners who are among the sons of Israel. Right. But there's something specific about them. Uncircumcised in heart, uncircumcised in flesh. Can someone who is foreign, can someone who was born in the flesh be uh, reborn? Yeah, they can be reborn. But uh, can they be circumcised in heart? They can be circumcised in heart. But there's a reality of the state that they're, in, they're currently in. You cannot choose someone. And we're going to talk about this more in a second to serve in his sanctuary, to serve in his house that is still operating in the flesh. No, he says, but the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who went astray uh, from me after their idols, shall bear the punishment for their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight in the gates of the house and ministering in the house. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and, and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Okay, notice the verbiage and what we're talking about here. Once again, he is literally saying... That he's still going to use this. The Levites who went far from me. These are not obedient people. So they went far from him. They're not near to him. They're far from him. Who went astray from me after their idols. These Levites, the people who were chosen. He's literally saying that, that I chose you for this. You went far from me. You chased idols. You're chasing idols. They shall bear the punishment for their iniquity. So they shall bear the punishment for their iniquity. Yet they shall be. So listen, he says all this punishment things, all these things that are not right about them. They're disobedient, blah, 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 blah. Right. He's saying all these things. Right. But then he says, yet they shall minister. They shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight at the gates of the house and ministering in the house. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. Now, notice the verbiage. Slaughter the burnt offering and sacrifice for the people. And they shall stand before them. Who's them? The people to minister to them. The people. Now, this is why this lesson is called ordaining priest to people versus Yahweh. And I apologize. Somehow on the top of this slide, there's an extra W put on Yahweh there. I apologize. Skip over that for me. But we have this situation where he's he's outlining that they're they were he is allowing them to minister to who to people to people, which is why this lesson's called ordaining priests to people versus Yahweh. There is a difference. There's two different types of priests. There's two different types of ministers. There are ministers to people, and there are ministers to Yahweh. That's the truth. Let's keep going. Because they ministered to them before their idols and became a stumbling block of iniquity to the house of Israel. Therefore, I have sworn against them, declares the Lord God, that they shall bear the punishment for their iniquity and they shall not come near to me to serve as a priest, um, to serve as a priest to me, nor come near to any of my holy things to the things that are most holy. But they will bear their shame in their abominations, which they have committed. Yet I will appoint them to keep charge of the house of all its service and all that shall be done in it. So once again, this is why I keep saying that he is going to use these things for the good because he's pointing out some things about them. He said they minister to them before their idols. 
So what does that mean? It means that these people are not knocking down the idols of the people. They're preserving their idols. They're not telling them that, oh, your love of money is wrong. They're not telling them that you shouldn't be, you know, uh, even uh, the most simple truth in the very beginning of the Bible. Adam was cursed for listening to his wife over Yahweh. They're not telling people that they shouldn't listen to their wife over God. They're not telling people that that uh, that you know in Revelations it says they would not repent for the works of their hands. We have the the disciples that were that gave up their physical lives to follow to follow Jesus. They're not telling people they should give up uh, 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 things in their life. They're not telling people that. They became a stumbling block of iniquity to the house of Israel. Therefore, I've sworn against them. But what does he say? They shall not come near to me to serve as a priest to me. So. Once again, there are people who are priests to people and priests to Yahweh. He says, I will let you minister to people, but you will not be a priest to me. You will not be a priest to me. You will not come near to me. And this is when you have to start waking up and realizing there are people, there are ministers that are near to Yahweh and there are ministers that are far from Yahweh. That he is not, he's allowing them to still be ministers to people, but they're not near to him. I talk to people who think that they are, they are the best ministers in the world and they know God the most and they don't know a word of the Lord. They don't know anything that Jesus Christ said. They're not familiar with the word of Christ. Because they're far from him. They're far from him. Let's keep going. Because this is a, um, our last little section right here. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the sons of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to me to minister to me. So he's literally saying when the sons of Israel uh, uh, fell away or a popular word that we have uh, today is uh, what, what, what's the word? Um, uh, what's the word that the people use that? Um, I can't remember the word right now. I don't even I don't use this word, but uh, it's like fall back or. People uh, regress in their journey, or I can't remember. I can't. I can't tell you what the, what that word is. I'm not familiar with it too too much. I don't use it too often. But he literally said when they went astray from him, but they kept charge of his sanctuary, which means they did not leave their post. They did not leave their nearness to him because of other people falling away. He said they shall come near to me to minister to who to me, to me to Yahweh. He says, listen. These people, these Levitical priests that did not fall away from me, they did not go away from me, did not chase idols. They shall come near to me to minister to me. And they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood. So these ministers are not doing anything for people. <laughs> Their servitude is to the Lord. They're serving the Lord. Two different types of priests. There are priests that serve people and there are priests that serve Yahweh. There are people that are that the uh, Yahweh allows to take care of people's concerns and people's uh, worries and people's focuses. And then there are priests that are chosen for Yahweh's concerns and Yahweh's focuses and Yahweh's uh, needs. Two different types of priests. They shall enter my, sec my sanctuary. They shall come near to my table to minister to me and keep my charge. It shall be that when they enter at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments and wool shall not be on them while they are ministering in the gates of the inner court and in the house. Linen turbans shall be on their heads and linen undergarments shall be on their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything which makes them sweat. OK, I'm going to break this down much more in a later class. I'm not going to get too deep into this. But the point is, we're seeing very clearly that there are people who he said they have went astray from him. There are people who are uncircumcised in heart. There are people who are chasing idols that he says he will allow them to be ministers to who to people. But he said when the sons of Israel, when his people went astray, there were the sons of Zad, the Levitical priests of Zad, the Zadok, right? The sons of Zadok. 
which is all a parable. A parable. It's not about anything physical, actual descendants of Zadok. It's not about that. It's about their nature that he's talking about. They kept charging my sanctuary. They did not go astray with the people. They did not chase after their idols. They shall come near to who? To Yahweh. To minister to him. To offer sacrifices to him. They shall come into the inner court. So the others will be in the house and they'll be at the gate. The gate. What, what is a gate? A gate is the entrance to the outside. He said the other ministers will be at the gate and they'll be in the house. But these ministers say they'll come to the inner court. Which is a, was a, a, just another parable about the nearness to God. And we have these parables in the Bible and then in the temple that he told them to make where we have a, the area that's for this, the holies. But then we have the holiest of holies. He said these ministers are coming to the inner court, the holiest of holies. They're in the inner court. The inner court. Now, we're going to go to Second Chronicles. He's going to talk about the Levites a little bit, right? Because the Levites were chosen to be ministers to him. They were chosen for this. Now it says, then he said to them, listen to me, O Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry the uncleanness out from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and turned their faces from the dwelling place of the Lord and have turned their backs. Let's keep reading. They have also shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord was against Judah and Jerusalem, and he he made them an object of terror, of horror, of hissing. And um, as you see with your own eyes, for behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now, it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to minister to him, and to be his ministers and burn incense. And now we're going to get into deeper about this parable of Levites, because what, what do we know about the Levites? You know, by this class, you should have read a lot about the Levites in the, in, in the really two classes ago in Shomer and God's Word. But the Levites are these people who God told them that they have no physical inheritance. Their inheritance is God. It's the Lord. They have the Lord. Which goes into the deeper parable of when we go into Jesus and he's telling his, his disciples to give up everything they own to follow him. It's because in spirit, they are Levites. It's in spirit. It's not about physical Levite. It's about the, the parable in spirit of the Levite that does not have a physical inheritance, but they have the Lord. They were chosen to be near to Jesus, near to Yahweh. They come near. Now, one of our greatest examples in the Bible of someone who was chosen to be a minister to the Lord is Samuel. First Samuel 3, 1. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Now, there's two things I want you to notice. I want you to notice about two things I want you to notice. Samuel, who we know is a minister to the Lord, because that's what it says it very clearly. That as a child, he was a minister to the Lord. This is not something anyone can choose for themselves. It's a heart that God gives you to be a minister to the Lord. And Eli could see it, that this is a minister to the Lord. This is not a minister to the people. This, guy, this boy ministers to the Lord. Now, we see two different things also that are, um, how do I say this? Because there were priests at this time, right? But he's saying that, that this, is, this is something that's rare about ministers to the Lord. It says, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. The word of the Lord is rare. It, 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 well, rare in that time. But let's say this. The word of the Lord is on the tongue of those who minister to the Lord. The word of the Lord flows through them. And visions were infrequent. So they also people who receive visions from God. Which we know that he said about Moses, that he said, if there's a prophet among you, 
I, I will come, I will uh, speak to him in a dream. I will visit him uh, or in a vision. Correct. So we know that uh, Samuel, just as Moses was, was definitely chosen to come near, <laughs> come near to Yahweh. Samuel is a is a is a minister to the Lord. Now, I want to go back because we talk about this circumcising heart situation, right? Now, why is it that someone that's chosen to be a minister to the Lord must have a circumcised heart? They must be reborn. It says, moreover, the Lord, your, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. So, reality is... The Lord your God will circumcise your heart in the heart of your descendants to love to. Now, why is it going to circumcise your heart to love the Lord your God with, with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live? It is not possible to love the Lord unless you are circumcised of heart. Your flesh must be removed in order to love the Lord in truth. Yes, there are many people who are in the flesh and they say they love the Lord and they, and they, they shout, they cry, they do all those things. But this next verse is going to make it very clear why I'm saying you must be circumcised in heart to love the Lord. Because what does the Lord say? John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So once again, let's look at reality. Is that people can cry, they can shout, they can dance, they can run around, they can speak in tongues, they can do all types of things. But there's only one thing that actually shows that you love him. That's being willing to keep his commandments. And what did he say back in Ezekiel 44 about these sons of Zadok, the Levitical priests? They kept his charge. Which in a sense is they kept his commandments. Why? Why? Because they're circumcised in heart. They love the Lord. So only the ministers that are circumcised in heart, that love the Lord, are actually able to be ministers to him. He will not accept a lawless priest. And this is very important discernment because you should walk around and discern. Is this a minister to people or a minister to Yahweh? Which one is it? Because a minister to Yahweh, I'm telling you the truth, does not strife with the commandments of God. They love God. They want to please God. Why would they strife with what God is saying pleases him? They're not going to strife with it. They love they, It's their joy to do it because they love him. Now, this goes deeper into the notion, like I was just talking about, how this is not fleshly we're talking about things in the spirit romans 2 29 but he is a jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit not by the letter and his praise is not from men but from god and i love the last part because we were just talking about this his praise is not from men but from god because what did we just what did i just talk about someone who's circumcised in heart someone who's reborn who has a heart to love the lord their god they want to please god they want they they don't look for praise from men they love receiving praise from god because that's who they want to please that's who they love that's who they love Now, if you haven't caught on yet to the parable about Jesus and the men that he chose, there's a reason why all of these men were Jews. They were Hebrews. It's not that he doesn't love Gentiles, but he only chose, though, and it's a parable. Once again, please don't get your carnal mind. Don't get the carnal mind wrapped up in our conversations. And the deeper I go, I'm going to stop saying this and it's going to be what it is. Uh, those who have ears to hear will hear what I'm saying to you. I'm not talking about physical Hebrews or physical Jews, just like that last verse was just saying. I'm not talking about Gentiles, physically Gentiles. I'm not talking about that, that, that God doesn't choose white people. That's not what I'm saying. It's a spirit, and this is a parable. Jesus was still operating in the, in the physical parable in his time. 
So in operating in the parable, he chose 12 men that were what? Jews. They were Hebrews because the parable is, is that these the, he, a Hebrew, a Jew is circumcised of heart. They love the Lord, their God. They love him so they keep his commandments. These 12 were chosen to come near to Jesus, who is Yahweh, Elohim. These 12 were chosen to be ministers to the Lord. They weren't chosen to be ministers to people. They were chosen to be ministers to Yahweh. Now, we have a couple examples in Acts and we have some good examples in um, Exodus about ministering, the, some examples of ministers to the Lord and ministers to people. Some really good examples. So we're going to read Acts 6 really quickly. We'll talk about this. We'll go read Exodus and we will be uh, wrapping up sooner than later. OK, so it says now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to, in order to serve tables. So once again. The 12, right? We just talked about how they were chosen to minister to the Lord. It's, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Because they are ministers to Yahweh. They're not ministers to people. They're ministers to Yahweh. He says, this is not our job. <laughs> it's not our job to worry about such a, a, a fleshly issue uh, as being overlooked for the daily serving of physical food. Now, if some, some of us would meet someone someone like this in his life and you're like, oh, they don't have love. Da, 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 da. No, they know their role. It's OK to know your role. Their role is not dealing with people arguing about physical food. Now, notice also when we talked about Samuel being ministered to the Lord. It was associated with how the word of the Lord was rare in those days, correct? Well, we also see them talking about how their their desire is to be is to focus on the word of God. That's a minister, a minister to Yahweh. Their their prime objective is the word of God. Because the word is God. <laughs> Jesus is the word. He's Yahweh Elohim. He's the, the word. That's that they want to serve the word. They want to know the word. They want to come closer to the word. They want to understand the word. They want to that. That is their objective is the word of God. That's a minister to the Lord. Their focus is on the word of God, not people. So it says, therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation for the spirit of wisdom who we may put in charge of this task. But we would devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So listen, he's like, it's giving you a difference between the ministry of the word versus a ministry to people. Is so he says, choose people to deal with these these fleshly issues of arguing over food. We, while we devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, ministry of the word and dealing with, 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 with people's physical issues are not the same. Actually, Paul writes himself and says that uh, an enlisted soldier does not uh, intertwine itself with the everyday issues of life. A minister to the Lord does not do that. So the statement found approved with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the, of the Holy Spirit and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Taman, Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And, and these they brought before the apostles after, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. So they chose seven men, seven men to be ministers to the people, to deal with the fleshly issues of these people. It's not that God was not with them because it says Stephen was full of the spirit and we know he was full of spirit. It's, Stephen was great, but that was his role was a ministry to the people. And honestly, I believe that um, Stephen was someone who. And, and we, we can talk about this more and more as we go, because 
it's quite possible that someone who's a minister to the Lord can find themselves in a role to minister to people. But you'll never find someone who's a minister to people find themselves in a role being a minister to the Lord. Because the rest of that in Ezekiel 44, and I'm going to go deeper into that in another class. That's why I, I didn't even bring this up. We're not going to talk about it yet. But he talks about when they leave the, the inner chamber that they will take off their holy garments so they don't transmit holiness to the people. So it's possible that if you're someone chosen to be a minister to Yahweh, you're able to go out to the people. But it's not possible if you're a minister to the people to go in to be a minister to the Lord. It doesn't work that way. Now let's go to Exodus because I want you to understand this is not anything new. This is the ways of Yahweh from the very beginning to the very end. The Old Testament, New Testament. There's really no difference. It's just understanding they bridge the gap. It came out the next day that Moses said to judge the people and the people stood about Moses from the morning until the evening. Now when Moses' father-in-law saw the, all that he was doing for the people, so notice what he's doing for the people. He said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge and all the people stand about you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a dispute, it comes to me and I judge between the man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out both yourself and all these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you, and you cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You be, uh, um, you be the people's representative before God, before God, a minister before the Lord. There we go. And bring the disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. Furthermore, you should select out of all the people, able men who fear God, men of truth, these who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands of hundreds of fifties and of tens. So once again, he says, find people to deal with the people. Let them judge the people at all times and let them be let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it'll be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all, and all these people um, also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. They judged the people at all times, the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, but every minor dispute they themselves would judge. So, once again, this is the concept from the very beginning. Before we even read in Ezekiel 44, he shows all that. Before we see what happens in Acts with, with the disciples and, and, the, and, and the, the serving of tables, this is not this is something that has been this way. Choosing people to minister to people and there are a fewer people who are chosen to minister before the Lord. Moses was someone who comes before God. And he chose people to bridge the gap, to be ministers to the people, to take care of their minor issues. Like, like oh, being overlooked for food in Acts. We just read. That's a minor issue. Now, getting into it. Galatians 2, 7 and 9. And this is what we're going to call. We, I talk, told you earlier, we're going to get into Paul's letters a little bit because you should be thinking about, okay, yeah, he wrote different types of things for, uh, he wrote different types of things for, for ministers to uphold, right? Listen to this. So Galatians 2, 7, 9, but on the contrary, saying that I have been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. We just talked about this. What does it mean to be uncircumcised? It means to be in the flesh. It means to be that you're not reborn yet. Just as Peter had been to the circumcised, what does that mean? To be reborn. To be circumcised is to be circumcised, to be able to love the Lord your God, to be able to uphold the commands of God. For he who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. So once again, and Paul actually was a, even though he was sent to the uncircumcised, he was a circumcised man though. But God worked with, with works with both ministries. There's no, he's not just working with those to the circumcised. He's also working with those to the uncircumcised. That's the truth. 
And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we may go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So once again, the parables, the Gentiles is what? It's a foreigner. The Gentile is what? Someone who is still in the flesh. The Gentile is what? Someone that uh, um, does not walk in the commands of God. And they to the circumcised. So those, a parable, we're not talking about flesh. Those who are reborn, those who have been, who, who have fled, who have shed their flesh, those who, have, who, who can walk in the commands of God, who are able. So we have to understand that when we read this, we know that the system that Paul made up, if you have not noticed, there's only one section in the Bible that's actually about physical churches. <laughs> and that's Paul's letters. Why? Because he set up the, the, the system, he set up the church for the ministers to people. Paul is the administrator of the ministry to people. Which is why he has a lot of stipulations about what these ministers to, should look like. And he says not beyond reproach. And he, he actually even talks about, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, want the, uh, um, people who are circumcised, wanting people who are uncircumcised to be circumcised so they don't persecute. Why? Because people who are uncircumcised are, have mass potential to be persecuted because they still live in the flesh. So we know that Paul set up this system for the uncircumcised. And that's why his stipulations are to cater to people in the flesh. And that's what it's, that's what it's for. But you notice when you read James, when you read John, when you read Peter's letters, he gives, they give no st of fleshly stipulations about what it means to serve God. They only talk about obeying him. Faith plus works is James. He writes a lot, a lot about that. Peter talks about the purification through love of the, of the brethren and obedience to the truth. John writes that sin is lawlessness. And, and um, what does it say? It says uh, 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 to, to uh, what does it say? To break the law is sin. He talks about the commands of God, the commands in the very beginning to love your brother. But they don't talk anything at all about fleshly stipulations in order to be a servant of God, because there are no fleshly stipulations to be a servant to Yahweh. Besides that, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. Which you cannot do unless you are circumcised. Which is obey the commands in truth to love him is. Which should bring you revelation as to why Jesus told his 12 disciples this. Why did he say this to them? Because you have to know your role. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So. What did he tell them? He literally says, go to the lost sheep of Israel. When we hear Israel, when we hear Jew, when we hear, uh, we hear Israel, we hear Jew, we hear Hebrew, we hear the parable of being circumcised of heart, being reborn, people who have shed their flesh, the, uh, the uh, people who, who are able to love him with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. People who obey his commands. Go to those people. Do not go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the uncircumcised. Don't go to people still in their flesh. Don't go to the foreigner. He told them this. And there are so many people that grit their teeth at these words, which I'm trying to tell you, there's a terrible choice to not accept the truth of what this of Jesus Christ has spoken. You're never going to understand. Until you believe and accept every word. 
But he told his disciples to go find who his men, the people who were chosen to minister to him is what he told them. He said, go find my ministers. He didn't neglect the ministry of the people. He sent Paul, he sent Barnabas for that. But for his 12 disciples, he said, go find people who are chosen to minister to me. Now notice it says, lost sheep of the house of Israel. The black and white truth here. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun, having to seal the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea of the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So these are the bond servants of our God, right? On the bond servants of, of our God. These people are, these 144,000 are chosen ministers to him. They're chosen ministers. They're chosen to minister before Yahweh. Check this next verse out, last verse. Then I looked and behold, the land was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their forehead. Now, when they were standing on the Mount Zion, who, wh wh who are they with? The 144,000 are with who? They are with Yahweh Elohim. They're with the, they're with the lamb. They're near to him. They were chosen to minister to him. And so I hope this, this lesson was good for you guys. Ordaining priests to people versus Yahweh. You should definitely know the, know the difference from, from this lesson. Of who is a priest to people and who's chosen to be a priest to Yahweh. There's no looking down on. There's no judging each one. But it's just truth. It's just truth. It's just truth. And so... Uh, Tyler Nall from MFH pulls $800 a week to ensure that God's word can and will continue through this ministry. We will then re redistribute all collective funds evenly back out to those that gave. We'll be the first to bless you. That's Cash App, Money Sign, Christ King Way. That's PayPal at MFH Ministry. This was Lesson 68 of Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness, Ordaining Priests to People versus Yahweh. I hope this blessed you and enlightened you and you see more clearly um, the, the priest around you and discerning who's the people and who's the Yahweh. Who's the people and who's the Yahweh. Are you the people or are you the Yahweh? Meditate on that. Be blessed, guys. We'll be back soon with Lesson 69.